at what point did you decide that you were going to enter this race, put your name in the ring, and uh, why did you decide that that's what you wanted to do? Well, the, the, in answer to that, the, the reason uh, I'm running really is because of the um, of what I see that's, well, sort of happened after I certainly filed for, uh, for the seat to run, but it's the COVID-19 pandemic that's really caught my attention, obviously, like the rest of us this year. And uh, I feel that it, the COVID-19 demands a uh, candidate uh, against the political status quo of the district. And what I mean by that is the effects of COVID-19 are so devastating uh, that it's, it's affected, obviously, the job market um, in certain sectors like hospitality and restaurants and fast food have been devastated. Um, maybe the overriding reason that I've run from almost day one is that what I've observed is Assemblywoman Lamone, she, she focuses almost exclusively on environmental issues, uh, but she doesn't build the clean energy sector. Okay? So she's, she's popular with corporate and union donors and many against big oil, uh, but few voters really understand her extreme voting record. And on my website, GaryMichaelsForSenate.com, I, I post, uh, there's no, I think almost 12 bills like this that I would consider are of extreme measure. So to just start, I'll, I'll begin with a place to begin our conversation with the Assembly Banking and Finance Committee that Ms. Lamont's chaired. This is a huge industry in California. It offers jobs, right? Capital, loans to start businesses. That goes to economic uh, in June of uh, this year, Ms. Lamone authored a bill called 2501, which is a COVID relief. Uh, this was a 360-day reprieve on mortgage payments, 260-day reprieve on car and payday loan. Uh, financial providers, uh, including Democrats, opposed the bill. Uh, auto and payday loaners well, would close their businesses permanently. The potential harm from AB 2501 was so great that many Democrats saw for what it was in their own party and they, it failed passage on the assembly floor. There's a Department of Oversight business, business oversight that includes actors to go after bad actors. But I raise this point, okay? So this, this illustrates a very key thing about Ms. Lamone. Uh, she, she collaborates only with housing and economic justice organizations. She does not uh, collaborate with private enterprise like banking and finance. So she loses opportunities for economic justice. Um, and in and, and, and doing so, uh, I think basically deprives us of creating um, a clean energy sector in Senate District 19. I know these jobs are needed here in Santa Maria where I'm at. The per capita income here is about $19,000. I know they're needed in Santa Barbara where the per capita income is $42,000 almost. I know they're needed there because the cost of living, rental, rentals, three grand for two bedrooms a month, homes that are millions of dollars. I know these jobs are needed. And uh, now is a great time to be moving forward on this. But my point is, is that she, she's focused on one thing and doesn't collaborate with everybody and misses key opportunities here for her constituents in this district. And, uh... What would you, you mentioned clean energy uh, being a focus here. Uh, what, what would you do if elected uh, to move forward to get those clean energy jobs into Santa Maria, Santa Barbara? Um, you know, what kind of steps would you take to make that happen? So just using this example of this committee, if I had been on this committee or chair of this committee as she has been, I would collaborate with everybody. I mean, I'm a very inclusive person. So I would be, of course, talking to the housing and environmental and economic justice people. But I would be cultivating relationships with banking and finance principles. Because those people, that's like the, the key to creating fine, uh, loans to, for startup enterprises in the, in the district. So when we talk about the clean energy sector, we're talking about wind and solar and battery and so forth. And, uh, and there's about, uh, I checked with EDD, there's about 290 of those jobs in Senate District in Sacramento County, and it's similar amount for oil and gas. Now, I know that this that we want to move from oil and gas, and I know that 
there's been a movement going on to eliminate more and more of those jobs. We should have by now doubled or even tripled this clean energy sector to make up for the loss in oil and gas jobs. And the reason why this isn't happening is because we're not, we're not engaging with people who could do something about it. And to speak one, one little bit further about it, I think there needs to be more of a, a collaborative uh, effort in the whole district when it comes to jobs. I really believe that after the pandemic here, it's going to be a little difficult to get employers to get more jobs into this marketplace here because of what's, it, it's going to take probably several years uh, for us to finally, you know, ride out the effect of COVID-19. Uh, so that means we have to be thinking about developing industries and startups here. Uh, and so what I would like to see in places like Oxnard or Santa Maria, where we have a very inexpensive commercial space where you can have warehouses, in Santa Barbara, where it's more expensive, but you have UCSB and uh, City College students who are trained for these kinds of jobs, these environmental jobs or internet type businesses. So you have a trained workforce. You know, in Santa Maria, we don't even have a baccalaureate program here. So if we collaborated, we could maybe set up some of the operation in Oxnard or Santa Maria with maybe the sales engineering or marketing office somewhere on State Street or in, in, the, uh, in a lot of the commercial real estate space that's now available throughout the city of Santa Barbara. So, and, and, and by the way, that builds off of a model that was back in 2006 and 2008. Sacramento passed legislation that attempted to align transportation and housing. And the goal was to make housing more affordable and to uh, make transportation uh, to that reduced the greenhouse gas emissions, right? And uh, these were popular laws and that and, and some might argue haven't been as successful as they have been deemed to be because housing is, is very not affordable. But we need to, I think, take those kinds of laws and apply them now also to the commercial sector, if for nothing else, to find jobs for people in the city of Ventura or Lompoc or Santa Paula or wherever, so they don't have to commute 60, 100, 140 miles each day. Because that, of course, goes to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Anyway, so I'm, I'm thinking collaboratively here about doing, to the, 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 we have a major problem with affordability in California, and especially where we're at here. The poverty rate, I think the last time I looked in Santa Barbara was, I think, 12 or 15%. In Santa Maria, it's almost 19%. That's because of, of how expensive it is to live here. I've seen so little done about these matters in the 15 years that I've lived in Santa Maria, that I've come to the conclusion that people in Sacramento don't have any idea how to do it. The only time I've seen the poverty numbers dip a little is during bumps in the Obama and Trump economies. But as far as California has gone, I, I've seen them do nothing, which leads me to believe they have no ideas. So I want to fight poverty here. I want to collaborate with justice organizations, with private industry, with banks and finance, with uh, smart people who are doing microgrids, battery development, and find ways to get more jobs into this district. And uh, uh, you, you mentioned uh, COVID-19 and jobs right off the bat. Right, do you feel, you know, what, what is the, in your mind, it's hard to point to one at times, but what is the most pressing issue right now that the district is facing? Is it, is it affordability uh, because of lack of jobs uh, locally? Is it uh, the effects of COVID-19? What, what's, what do you think is? Uh, well, I think the most pressing thing went right now with an 11 or 12 or 13% unemployment rate would be wages and jobs basically. And, and doing what you can to either restore the sectors that have been most devastated and we know them to be, let's see, we know them to be State Street business uh, is really down. We know restaurants are down. We know uh, hotels that are business hotels or hotels that are USCSB are down, uh, meaning that their business is off. People have been furloughed. Uh, they're not getting their jobs back. There's been permanent layoffs. So I, think, I think in terms of the priority where there's the permanent layoff and the industry sector's hardest hit, are the ones that require attention for us. What uh, would you do if elected uh, to, uh, you know, take steps to address those industries that have been hit the hardest, the hotels, 
uh, and tourism sectors as well um, that have been affected most by the pandemic? What, what are uh, some of your ideas to try to, to stem that tide? Sure. So just as an example, and I have this on my website under um, Highway 101 Tech. So Bob Tuller is with Radius Commercial. He produced a webinar a few weeks ago. And Ryan, I learned there that uh, the retail vacancy rate on, on Santa Barbara streets is somewhere between 12 to 18 percent. And there, there's some concern that it could go north of 20 percent. Experts in the commercial real estate business say that if it goes beyond 20 percent, it will take five years to recover. They, they also mentioned during this webinar that Santa Barbara office space volume is down 47 uh, percent. And, and the commercial realtors commented they haven't seen that since 2009. Uh, there's been talk that Macy's may convert its second and third floors into office space. So look, Santa Barbara already has high-tech companies. You have Amazon, Invico, Green Hills Software, Zoom Video, Well Health and so forth are in the Santa Barbara area. I, I think what you asked me what I would do, I would uh, author bills to incentivize tech companies to come to Santa Barbara as, as well as Santa Maria and Oxnard. I would basically build on the highway Tech 101 relocation that's already been in motion now for a few years. And then I, you know, I, I would collaborate with other senators to encourage more clean energy businesses and environmental startups uh, to move into these unleased office space. And along the lines of what I've already mentioned to you, which is to try to do something district wide if at all possible. I mean, uh, to, just to put it in, one, in, in another way, you know, in Santa Maria, where I'm at, and the poverty rate's almost 19%. Right. Um, there's, there's, there's been really no effort ever done to try to alleviate that by job growth. And I, I know that there have been um, other, there have been, we, we can, so we, so bear with me, there's uh, other people who've done this and with, with, with some degree of success of plugging in the, the poverty stream uh, with, uh, into the digital economy. In fact, as I'm looking for a name, and that is, of course, none other than uh, Leela Jana, who was an Indian immigrant, and she was raised in Los Angeles. So she created a company. She believed that dignified work should be available for everyone. She, she created a company that hired uh, workers in impoverished areas. She plugged them into the digital economy. So we should be doing the same thing like that in Oxnard and Santa Maria and elsewhere in this district. Uh, we could plug them in and they into a variety of clean energy type jobs with electricity, grids, wind turbines, and so forth. And I would be sponsoring bills uh, really focused at that. I, I would like to see uh, the leadership for these kind of businesses coming out of the US CSB environmental services studies area. The people there are trained to do these sorts of things and there, and they would collaborate to get uh, businesses started up here in Santa Maria and Oxnard and elsewhere. This is another it, based on your specific experience um, you know, that some people may not know, uh, you know, what is what in your background uh, makes you the best candidate to uh, be able to deliver uh, and help uh, address these problems that you've already brought up uh, about the, the, the poverty, the, the, uh, the lack of jobs uh, and the, the economy that has obviously seen uh, such a swoon since the, the pandemic really took hold. Uh, well, I have my own business and I've had it for six years. I'm the managing partner of Suma Solutions. Uh, so this is a telecommunications agency uh, dedicated to helping businesses in K-12 schools uh, contract with fiber carriers. It provides uh, VoIP, managed VoIP services, uh, a plethora of tele telecom services for schools and businesses. Um, uh, and I have a sister company known as Suma E-Rate Solutions, which provides the uh, E-rate uh, discount uh, it provides consulting services to get E-rate discounts for K-12 schools. Uh, so a little bit about me. So uh, I came to Santa Maria in 2005. I launched Comcast's coaxial and fiber uh, business services operation in Northern County. I essentially have had two careers. One is one that you're in, which is broadcasting and cable, and the other is telecommunications. I uh, held uh, managerial marketing and administrative jobs, which require organizational skill. I've also had entrepreneurial jobs, which require risk-taking, creativity, and lateral thinking. And I also trained in public and nonprofit accounting, 
And I've also had independent and corporate marketing experience uh, to the local, state, and federal governments and private and public schools. So I'm, because I've been in business, I obviously understand what, what it takes to succeed and to provide a quality service. And um, it allows me to identify and empathize with those who deal with unexpected circumstances. I deal with that all the time. How do you weigh uh, the, uh, the balance uh, that some voter, each voter kind of has differently in their head uh, when voting for a candidate having the experience in, in a uh, California state legislature, for example, as Monique Lamone does, or uh, versus the advantages or disadvantages of being an outsider uh, and taking a fresh perspective in, um, you know, where, where do you weigh yourself uh, as someone uh, coming from a different experience than someone who uh, may have held a similar office? That's a very great question. And, you know, I'm, I'm a businessman and I, I'm not in the habit of, um, Bad mouthing people or speaking poorly of them in any way because that's not a positive way of doing business. But I, I really think uh, the program you're doing here is very important because the, the voters need to know that Ms. Lamone, and, and notwithstanding that she has four years of experience in December, she has an extreme voting record. I mean, far, far to the left of the district. And I, I believe the district is a progressive district. Uh, by and large, majority of progressive. So she's far to the left of that. Uh, I have noticed on the forums I participated with her that she's either apologizing for her voting record or claiming to talk to everyone and then um, admitting that she's failed and not getting things done. I've already pointed out that I think I think what well, I think the issue is she has uh, she's an extreme idealist, and because of that. Uh, into her idealism um, way she thinks things should be, she's, she doesn't include stakeholders like private enterprise, like insurance companies, like banking and finance committees. So she misses key opportunities to collaborate with people that could really um, move jobs, wages, and affordability in our district. I think she's, um, she's, uh, bought and paid for by the unions, I, I have to say. I think she gets $167,000 of contributions from them. And, of, and her, I think her total contributions range in the neighborhood of seven to $800,000. So you see that because of that, even to the detriment of others, she's voted for AB5, which is uh, extends employee classification status to gig workers. But one that you might not know about is she's also uh, voted for AB890. Uh, which is the uh, nurse practitioner's scope of practice. Uh, again, the nurses union uh, gives her uh, contributions. So this is a bill that grants nurse practitioners the right to practice medicine without a competent review. So again, extremism, and I can, if you want, I can walk you through some of these bills. It's like, uh, like for example, uh, AB 3234, which she voted on, which is a public safety bill, this is a diversion bill, okay? So diversion means the court takes the case over and then it dismisses the case and, uh, and then the uh, misdemeanor is erased from the defendant's record. But the misdemeanors can be things like child abuse, hate crimes, oral copulations, firearms offenses. I mean, this, this bill is so extreme that it's basically uh, changing the criminal justice system over. This was one of these bills that uh, was passed during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic when, when committees were downsized and there was little opportunity for, for discussion about these things. Um, I think another uh, grave bill that I think demonstrates extreme extremism is AB 186. So this bill authorizes the city and county of San Francisco to approve overdose programs, basically, um, Basically, these are programs that allow drug use uh, in, in uh, injection centers that have uh, sorry, injection centers in San, in San Francisco. The governor vetoed these bills because they were so I mean, he, he repeated that enabling illegal and destruction drug use will never work. The, the point is, is that she's voting for bills like this, and I've had the time to maybe research about a dozen of them, but it seems every few days somebody is emailing me about some other bill that she has authored or voted on that I think is really out of bounds for the voters in Senate District 19.
So I would be uh, completely in contrast, nothing like that. I'm, I collaborate with everybody. I, I want to move the entire community forward. I will speak to anybody and work with anyone, uh, whatever their politics. And, uh, and I think I would uh, really move the needle here for the district in terms of job and wage growth and uh, aligning the environmental mission of Senate District 19 with the economic mission as well. And uh, just bringing that up, that, that's uh, something that Monique touched on in terms of uh, collaborating and trying to, uh, to work with everyone. Um, you mentioned some of the voting record concerns that you have. Um, she, is, uh, she has said that of the bills that she's authored, the vast majority of them have received bipartisan support um, when brought to the legislature. I just wanted to see what your you know, response to that is in terms of the bill she's authored. Uh, she said, seems to say a lot of them are seeing bipartisan support and uh, presenting them. Um, sure. I don't know if you have a, a response based on what you've seen and what the bills uh, that she's written uh, strike a chord with you. No, I would say it's not true because I don't see bipartisan support uh, at all. I mean, uh, other than uh, maybe budget bills, but when it comes to a lot of these bills that I have on my website, GaryMichaelsForSenate.com, uh, they are not uh, bipartisan support at all. I don't think it's a true statement. When it comes to uh, the pandemic, uh, you've talked about the issues that it's created for the district. What has it taught you uh, that, or made you realize perhaps that you uh, maybe hadn't thought about before? What has the experience that we've all gone through with COVID-19 for you, uh, what new perspective perhaps has, has the past few months given you that uh, maybe you, you hadn't thought about before? Well, it's a wake-up call that we need to do testing in the state. Uh, I mean, statewide testing. We have multiple things going on here. We have uh, wildfires. We have the pandemic. Um, we have uh, we're an earthquake-prone region. And we have uh, really any major ones for probably five years, which means that when we do have one, it could be a real disaster. Uh, we we need to be doing statewide drills. Um, this is why uh, we have done so poorly with this pandemic. And I, I, think, I, I, would, I think the Chinese who've had far more experience with this have, have done much better uh, than we have. We don't have, we're not coordinated. Different states are doing different things. Um, but, but we're a state that has a lot of risk because of our, the wildfire problem we have and because of the earthquakes we have. So I think Ms. Lamone last chaired uh, a nonprofit sector meeting, which included a uh, discussion about um, emergency preparation. It lasted in October of 2019. I mean, that's an indication of how we are asleep at the switch and that we need to be uh, engaging in this topic uh, right off the bat in Sacramento and organizing programs to have statewide uh, testing and drills um, so that we're more, uh, we'll, we'll be prepared when we do have the major earthquake and, um, and hopefully not lose a lot of homes, which is an issue right now in the state. So we, we need to really uh, do statewide testing. So when, you, when you're saying uh, testing and drills, the drills you're referring to earthquakes, uh, statewide drills for earthquakes and for testing, you're, you're referring to, uh, to COVID testing, is that right? Could you just clarify? What I think there needs, there needs to be uh, some kind of legislation that really uh, creates and we have to prepare for pretty much anything. Obviously, you know, if kids are uh, regularly get, uh, go, uh, going through drills in their classroom for earthquake preparation or whatever, then when it finally happens, the, the, the damage is not as, I mean, they're prepared for it. Uh, I think we need to, to take a similar approach here. I, and I think that would not only include earthquakes, but it's, it's very likely we'll have more pandemics. Uh, I think we really need to take a hard look at what we've just done the last half a year, because I think a lot of it's not been successful. And uh, so we're better prepared when it's going to happen again. Uh, I think the wildfires is another issue. People have lost their lives to these wildfires. I think climate change is, is a factor, but it's not the only factor. And I, I hear Ms. Lamone 
blaming it on climate change, but there are other things that, that could be done, tree density, brush, and so forth. And we need to prepare people that live in these areas uh, for these kinds of emergencies. We haven't done enough in, in, with any of these things. There is no statewide testing preparation for earthquakes, for pandemics, for wildfires. Uh, and there are preparations for certain sectors to respond, but not for the citizen. And we need to move this to the citizen. Uh, I'll quickly go to uh, the wildfires point for just a moment because you brought it up. Uh, I talked to firefighters uh, about it not long ago, um, about the, the problem obviously getting worse, uh, and we're seeing that problem stick with us. Um, and, you, and you mentioned some things that uh, we could perhaps do to alleviate them in the future. What, uh, in, in terms of uh, thinning forests or, or, or things of that nature, what are some of the things that you would try to move forward if elected uh, to uh, perhaps change the, this string of wildfires seemingly only getting worse in the past uh, five to 10 years? Sure, uh, a few things like we've already discussed, so I would have some kind of drill preparation. I, and I've already mentioned that I, I think that, um, certainly uh, addressing tree density and uh, uh, also um, uh, the brush that we have uh, in many areas is too thick. Um, I think, um, what else can I say? I would say that um, we need to do the more home hardening. So we have to actually prepare homes uh, where, where they're better prepared uh, for fires. There's really very little, if anything, that's been done. Uh, Sacramento has, um, you know, various senators or assembly members have uh, authored bills that have gone nowhere. Um, Gavin Newsom, the governor, had talked about providing, I think, a billion dollars for this program when he first ran for office in 2018. Uh, nothing has come of it. Secure, uh, especially if we're going to be building homes in risky areas, there should be some sort of hard, uh, hardening protocol. Um, and Ms. Lamone, uh, I think, is honestly authored a bill called AB 2367, uh, which was a, um, a property insurance wildfire bill. And what this did basically was it created the idea of a task force that would create hard, hard home hardening standards. And then there was no man, no date of when that would occur. That could occur next year, three, four, three years but the insurance companies would be on the hook to uh, accept all homeowner policies, uh, regardless of whatever the condition of the task force decides. So um, that is, uh, puts the risk on the insurance companies. And we're already in a state uh, where uh, we have not priced in the risk of, of climate change. Insurance companies haven't been permitted that. So they're having a hard time making a profit. In 2017, the fires were so were so bad they lost all of their profit in 10 years. Uh, so we we we're really we're our our citizens are uh, at risk here because we're not really uh, properly dealing with this situation. And and I'm afraid we're going to see more property loss and more lives lost if we sit idly and don't pass the required legislation. Uh, when you you alluded to it. Um with the pandemic, uh, and you, you think that we should be more we should have been more prepared before this one, uh, and, and that we should be more prepared for those in the future. In terms of after it started, from March until now, when things started, uh, when we started responding and reacting to it, uh, locally, what have you seen uh, that you wish were different in terms of how we reacted, politicians and governments locally reacted to? Uh, to the COVID crisis that you would have done differently uh, or that you would do differently if you were elected moving forward? Yeah, I think um, on that, I would say um, there has been, I, I, I believe in the mask and I, I don't think that's been properly enforced. Uh, I know where I live in San I see people about them. Um, I, I, up in Pismo Beach and really off of the county, uh, some people wear it, some don't. Um, I mean, this basically has been a, a crisis where there's a small number of people who've been really impacted by COVID-19 and are at risk to lose their lives. And the problem is, is that the rest of us uh, are all, it may not affect us, but we, we have to accommodate them. So I, I think it's appropriate um, that uh, 
face masks are worn. I think the, the, the issue about closing down the economy is not very well at all. We, we really have really hurt ourselves in California. And I, I think that um, it, it, the, a part of the problem also is we've, what I've seen the last several months is this is becoming a politicized event. And uh, we really need to move this away from the politicians and move it toward the healthcare experts. So what we see in the camera, solutions about this, we need to see that coming from the healthcare experts, less from politicians. Uh, I think if politics were taken out of it, I think it would be uh, far more effective than it has been. Uh, let's move now to uh, sort of related to COVID, but with, with schools and education, um, I, I believe you have some education experience yourself. What, you know, how does that play into uh, how you feel about uh, the state of schools right now when it comes to not only COVID and reopening them, but also just in general before, regardless of the pandemic, uh, how you approach the issue of education in the district? Sure. So I, I listen, I'm, my educational experience is that I'm a college graduate and uh, I'm on the San Maria Citizen Bonds Committee for a school that's being opened uh, here that was just open actually once. Uh, so um, my sister has a PhD in special education. I consult with her very often. Uh, when I have questions about K-12 schools, I have other cousins who've been teachers and I speak with them. Uh, so I, I am uh, I firmly believe that cities like Santa Maria and Oxnard really can move ahead. When, when they graduate uh, students, K-12 students, high school students, that are very proficient in math and English. Because the better they do, the more likely we're going to attract employers that need, that demand, uh, you know, a higher level, higher bar from the employees. Right? And, and you get that by having an, an educated workforce. And you, you could see in Santa Barbara, having UCSB in the city council, what that's going to say. But Santa Maria is not quite there with that. And I don't believe Oxnard is either and other places in the district. So I'm a, a great proponent for um, getting this uh, moving along. Now, in places like Oxnard and Santa Maria, we have a disproportionate number of students who are not, as they say, close the achievement gap. And the, the history on that is Governor Jerry Brown six years ago to respond to that problem, created something called the local control funding formula which allocates hundreds of millions of dollars to these kinds of students. But it, it seems that it's getting to the schools, but ultimately not efficiently to the students. Uh, there, are, there have been really almost no accountability studies on this program in the first five years of uh, its um, implementation. Uh, but now we're starting to see that uh, we're learning that they're hiring teachers at these schools, but they don't have a lot of experience. And so students are not, um, uh, getting, getting the grades they should be getting, they're not getting enough attention. Um, and now in the COVID-19 world, where we're moving the class, we moved it from in person to online, right? Uh, so they're working out of their homes. So if you're a student that's already not been succeeding in the classroom, how is that gonna work for you that it's not gonna be in your house on the internet? But the answer is it's not. And one of the really, uh, these travesties I've seen done by Ms. Lamone, she, uh, she voted for SD 98, which basically funded our K-12 schools. This happened at the end of June of this year. But it took away money for home study and independent type charters. Now, why is that important? Because if you're a student that's not doing very well, then you need special attention to get you up to par, to get you to where you're competitive with your class and your peers. And these kinds of charter programs, these kinds of independent study programs are the answer to that. But instead, what's happened is uh, we've gone to the status quo and um, find, providing money for teachers to learn how to do distance learning and, um, and not addressing those students that are struggling. And unfortunately, uh, in like Oxnard, for example, Oxnard High School, when we look at the state uh, assessment scores, uh, less than one in five are passing the math test there. I can't remember what this be on English. It's something like 30 or 40 percent pass. It's, it's it's far far from what's needed. There's there's no way 
we're going to be able to convince tech companies that are now coming to this part of the country because they, Silicon Valley is either too expensive or just not working out for them. We can get them in Santa Barbara. We're going to have a hard time convincing them to come to Santa Maria and Oxnard if we don't get the workforce there that are capable of accommodating these kinds of jobs. So this is a very, very important thing. It goes to uh, the economic justice of these communities. It's, it's really key. And it's a very big issue with me. And I want to see the answer is more accountability with these programs because there's been virtually no accountability. And listen, I'm not throwing public education over the, you know, over here, under the bus, so, so to speak. Uh, I'm uh, someone that went to public education, went through public schools. I know they can work. I know they can work here in Santa Maria where I live, but they're not working for enough, enough students. And that needs to be corrected. That needs to be corrected now. Uh, looking back at, uh, at this seat and Hannah Beth Jackson's tenure over the last uh, two terms, what, you know, what did your takeaway from that time? What would you uh, do differently if you were elected uh, compared to what uh, this district has seen over the past eight years? Well, yeah, that's actually another reason why I'm running since you brought it up. Um, the, uh, I, probably as a landmark in Santa Maria here is the DMV. So I, I came to Santa Maria in 2005. They were talking then about changing it because it was built in the 60s and first used in 1970. In 1970, the population of Santa Maria was less than 33,000. Now it's more than 107,000. So this building is so out of date. Every day when it's open, lines of people are spilling outside of it. And we're told now that a new DMV will be built next year, but we still have no firm dates. So I bring this up to make a point. And that point is, is the fact that that obsolete building has been sitting there for so long makes a statement about Santa Barbara-based Hannah Beth Jackson. I don't think she prioritizes Santa Maria at all. I, I have knowledge that she does not speak to the local, many, if not all, of the locally elected leaders here. She comes here and she does presentations but that's not the same thing as collaborating and communicating with our locally elected leaders. And, and what's worse is Senator Hannah Beth Jackson has told us that uh, Monique Lamone is her protege. So that would tell me that I can expect the same uh, lack of collaboration, the lack of lack of inclusion from Ms. Lamone as I have from Ms. Jackson. And that's a reason why I'm running as well. Okay? Because I believe if this is the case in San Bruno, I darn well that believe that this is also the case in Oxnard and Ventura and Fillmore and you name it, okay? That, that basically people are not getting the attention and the community, the issues in these communities like our DMV have not been moving forward because of the lack of leadership from state politicians and their inability to collaborate and include everybody. I want to be very clear but I'm a very collaborative person and I believe in inclusivity with everyone because that's what makes business work. If you don't have that, you can't get team playing going. You can't get all your departments and operations aligned and working cohesively, you'll not succeed. So I would be the opposite of Ms. Jackson and I guess Ms. Lamone on this issue. Well, you uh, kind of, perhaps answer this question in the, just that last, uh, that last part there, but um, generally when voters hear your name, they hear this piece, or they see your name on the ballot, or see it uh, you know, somewhere else, what is the thought or the takeaway that you want a voter to have when they hear your name, just that first takeaway that they have, when, that they associate with you and your name? Uh, well, let me just think about that for a second. I think there are several things. Um, Maybe three things. Uh, I, I want them to think that I'm someone that really wants to find affordability for the American family in this district. I believe affordability is, is two things. It's getting costs down, right? So your cost of living, and what are they? Your rental costs, your utility costs. Um, so I, I think that I'm really going to fight for affordability there. And I, I really believe that a lot of the reasons why we haven't had the kind of housing affordability is because there, there aren't enough uh, legislatures in Sacramento who are adept at dealing with, uh, basically schmoozing with 
uh, their, their peers and with the executive branch, with the executive government instead of now. They just don't really have that skill, those skills about them that they can work uh, with, with anybody and make everyone feel at ease and bring people together to collaborate, to find common ground to make a deal. So I want, I want these uh, American, I want the voters to know that. I want them to know that I also believe top line growth is the other issue, which is getting wages up. In California, we've been very good in the public sector with getting wages up. I don't think it's gone necessarily so well for the private sector. And again, that's where I want to align these environmental and economic justice issues that I've been talking about during this interview. So we start getting jobs in here that are higher wage jobs, which makes it possible for a student that's at UCSB or the city college there that wants to stay in the market, but, but haven't been able to because they couldn't find a job. Well, now they'll be able to, to find that job where it makes it possible where the uh, cost of living or the per capita income in Oxnard at $22,000, which is too low, considering how near it is to the Los Angeles area, uh, we can get that, that per capita income up maybe two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000. And likewise, the same here in Santa Maria, where the per capita income is $19,000. So I, I want them to know these issues and I want them to understand, I'll, I'll just leave it at this, that if you will like me, I will be directly communicating with all the local jurisdictions, all the local leaders, the city council, the mayors. I'm going to support their needs, move their needs forward. I'm, I want to uh, basically make contact with these people, with these council members every month. My team will do this. Uh, I'm going to be the outlet for them, and I'm going to insist that my staff uh, and provide this for all, the, uh, all these communities. I'll be available to all the elected leaders. I'll be working with everybody, and uh, and I therefore will be working with all the constituents in the uh, in the district, whatever their politics. Well, we covered a whole lot, um, but are there? Uh, I wanted to ask you: Are there uh, perhaps two, one or two topics that uh, you haven't brought up yet that you think are, you know, important that you also want to bring up and address as something that is on your mind uh, that you would be focused on if you were elected? Thank you for that. Uh, so I, I want to, some of the other topics would be, I, I want to make sure the cities are safe. So I want law enforcement respected in the district. But I also want fairness and justice for everybody. Um, I know that in the city of Santa Barbara, the city council there has formed, uh, or is in the process of forming a review board for the police department. I want to hear more about that. Uh, I, from what I read, I, I think the police, you know, are maybe overdeployed. Uh, I, I've, I've heard the, the chief of police in Oxnard say that in 2019, he had 2,000 customer service calls for the homeless. Uh, so if that's such a large number, that has to be taking away time and effort from other areas. So I want to work on, on making uh, the police more efficient. And I want to basically make sure that there is fairness and justice for everyone, uh, that we have resources uh, that are adequate for the basics, and that I want to make Sacramento a place that's not burdensome. And basically, my, my approach is that I want to respect the will of the local governments here. And I don't want voters to, to feel that Sacramento isn't working for them and it's burdensome, that they have no one that they really can talk to you about what's going on there because I am all about communication. And if I were to become senator, if the voters would elect me uh, to this very important role, I would make that my business to have ongoing communications using all the technology we have today, from town halls to blogs and everything else. I'm going to make communication a very key thing because I would like to see not only change occur here in Senate District 19, but I think with, given the uh, amount of uh, people that we have here that are smart and talented and that are committed to making uh, positive change in the state, uh, that we, we should take, um, to the, our, our cities, excuse me, we should take this uh, and, and basically turn it into a movement to really make some positive changes throughout California. And the state needs this now more than ever before, given uh, the multitude of problems that we are facing. We need action, we need collaboration, and we need to find common ground with each other. 
And uh, anyway, that is what I stand for. Right now. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll just leave leave you with one last uh, you know opportunity. If, there, if there's something that you know anything that you haven't said yet that you think is important or kind of a, a lasting uh, uh, you know message to voters, uh, you've touched on it several times, of course, but just wanted to uh, kind of well, leave I it open. The last thing with you, sorry, Ryan, you, you brought it up before. I mean, you know, I'm I'm obviously running against. Um, I, I feel like I'm frankly. You know, in the 1984 uh, Apple commercial, you know, where I'm trying to break conformity um, with uh, running up against Assemblywoman Malik Lamon, because you know when you have a uh, donors, corporate donors, union donors giving her seven, eight hundred thousand dollars, I'm some small businessman in Santa Maria that is something to go up against, and she obviously has been in the assembly for four years. But I will point out to the voters, as I have said early on. But her record is very extreme, okay? There's plenty of bills. Please go to Gary Michaels for Senate.com and read about how many of these bills are that she has either authored or voted for that I think are really out of step with this community. And, uh, and that we see time and time again that she does not collaborate with private enterprise, with banking and finance. She, she excludes certain stakeholders. It's so key to us, to here in Santa Maria where I'm at, where we can finally get the per capita income going north of 19 or $20,000, where we can really get the poverty rate down here to maybe under 15% instead of almost 19% of where it is today. It's ridiculous. I've been watching these problems for 15 years. You know, I'm tired of it. And that's one of the reasons I'm here today talking to you. Enough is enough. And, all, and then what happens is when it's bad like it always is, when all the affordability issues are always there, and they're there for the family, or you know, they're working two or three low-income jobs to pay for their rental unit or a mortgage. Homes are now in Santa Maria, four or five hundred thousand dollars. When you see workforce housing here, where nothing has been done about it, where farmers, uh, to to take advantage of the H two A visa program, are are getting immigrants from Mexico and they have to house them. So they put eight, nine, ten people in a house, right? Which is taking, by the way, uh, rental units away from seniors who now are at risk of being thrown out on the street. Uh, we're, where we've seen COVID nineteen uh, peak in these overcrowded houses. When you see that nothing is done about these kinds of pr problems, when you see the K twelve school constantly struggling with these assessment tests, not able to attract higher quality employers in Santa Maria. Year after year, it's time for really big changes. That's going to take leadership changes in Sacramento. And that's what I'm here to do. And I'm willing to do this. And I'm, I'm hoping uh, that the voters will vote for me. And I look forward to uh, collaborating and uh, moving the entire community forward in positive uh, and important in, uh, directions. Thank you.